is it true that YouTube hates small streamers and small content providers? Well, you know, normally I start off the show by saying, hmm, I don't know. Oh, and then, oh, one thing I do know. Well, I'll tell you what, YouTube did prove yesterday that they have no time and they don't care about smaller content creators. Yes, I found that out for sure. One thing else I know for sure is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Jeff McAleer back once again. Today is Wednesday, January 17th, which means it's War Game Wednesday. And if you don't know, I am the host here at The Daily Dope, as well as the Grand Poobah of TheGamingGang.com. So welcome aboard if you haven't watched before. Uh, thanks for stopping by. I am streaming live. There is chat. It is not on screen though, but there is chat through Twitch as well as YouTube. So if uh, I'm talking about something and you want to chime in or just say hello, I will of course uh, indicate that you've done so. <laughs> I'll give you a shout out. Anyway, as I start off the show today, I found out yesterday, I get this email from YouTube informing me that as of February 20th, I will no longer be able to monetize the gaming gang because I'm about 115 subscribers short of what they, they want a thousand subscribers and I'm a couple hundred hours of watch time over the past 12 months shy as well. They want 4,000 hours of watch time and the interwebs is exploding over this and I can see why. And I gotta be really honest, YouTube's email is pretty insulting. The way it comes across and oh, we've talked to you know, all these various different content creators and this is what we've decided to do. And basically what they're trying to say is that uh, you know they wanna protect their advertisers uh, and uh, also the core values of YouTube because of that huge outrage of, I'm not gonna name the streamer's name who's got millions of subscribers for some ungodly reason. Cause looking at him, you just would say, hey, I, I would punch you out just on principle alone when I saw you. Cause he, it's one of those kind of people, right? So anyway, so he had posted uh, a video of himself in Japan and he ran across a very tragic site. It was uh, someone who'd committed suicide and their body was floating in kind of this creek. And being the ass clown that this guy is, he was poking the body. And of course, YouTube, oh, they were promoting that video because he's got such a big following. Yeah, well, there was tons of backlash all over the web. Uh, so I guess YouTube has decided what they're going to do is, um, they're going to stop smaller streamers and uh, content creators from making any money because I guess that solves their problem. I don't know. Do not know. But one thing I have found out is that, um, you know, over the years since the gaming gang launched in 2010, my attitude has always been that the time I could spend working on these little, uh, shady kind of tips and tricks on how to grow your channel and get subscribers or get more uh, followers or likes and things like that. All that time I could invest doing that stuff, I wanted to spend my time actually writing stuff or recording stuff that geeks and gamers would like to read or listen to or watch. And I guess I was wrong in that attitude. I guess uh, my approach was uh, completely incorrect. So I have um, never really been hell bent on really getting word out about the gaming gang. And of course, our videos on YouTube through social media. And uh, I guess I'm gonna have to pay for it. Anyway, not, uh, not that I was pulling in thousands of dollars from YouTube, but I have to admit that um, it paid for the hosting of the website 
about three months a year, three, four months a year on average. So anyway, I guess, you know, YouTube just thinks, who cares? You know, we don't care. But uh, thankfully, I have to say, at the website, we still pull in about 95 to 100,000 unique visitors a month. So if you are someone who goes and visits the website, thank you so much, because that really is the lifeblood. Uh, the videos on YouTube and that, big deal. It's not like I make tons of money, but still, I can see where it's infuriating for a lot of people out there. A lot of people who have uh, put out some really, really good stuff that, uh, you know, the, the big uh, big YouTubers out there with millions of followers, a lot of times, a lot of their stuff, I didn't even think compared to stuff I've seen that smaller individuals who really care about what they're doing are producing out there. Anyway, I'm not going to harp on about that because uh, that'll just uh, tick me off and uh, make me want to use uh, non-family friendly language about the situation. So anyway, let's move on to happier stuff kind of a quiet news day today but as I was prepping the news I got a, a delivery so it was a pretty good sized box and I'm thinking oh okay it must be uh I don't know um from GMT was my oh I just got word my good pal Julie Ahern is uh not feeling too hot so uh hey Julie hope you're feeling better just uh, I got a little Facebook notice because I have a news piece from Greenbrier and uh, I don't have really any images. So I was asking her if she had some images I could use. But unfortunately, Julie, you were sick and uh, I can't do anything with those images if you send them now. Anyway, so hey, Julie. Anyway, back to what I was saying. So uh, I get this box and I'm thinking, oh, OK, it's GMT. And I'm thinking, you know what? I didn't realize they had stuff shipping right now. I know my good buddy Herman Lettman's uh, Franco-Prussian War game is coming out, but I knew it wasn't shipping yet. So anyway, so I pick up this box and I take a look and hey, it's not from GMT. It's from Ninja Division and it includes four games. So I've got four other games now added to the agenda and I was going to show them off real quick. So I've got the Agents so uh, most of these games I really don't know much about. Uh, I have not, uh, Ninja Division and I have just started uh, kind of communicating a bit. And uh, so we've got that. Why do I say we all the time? I've got that. We'll get to share it and see it. Then I've got Dance of the Fireflies, which I do know a bit about because I did post a news piece about this. And uh, this game is, if I remember correctly from the news piece, is you're, you're creating flowers, or you may, is, I think you're creating gardens with flowers. So this looks like this would be a nice title for the uh, Family Fun Friday for us to take a peek at. In fact, um, I don't know, we'll have to see. I plan on reviewing Ancestry on Friday from Calliope Games. Then there's Tokyo Ghoul, the card game, which is an anime, and I do believe it's also a manga, manga, that uh, is, well, I, I've heard of it. So, I mean, right there, that means it's got to be somewhat popular. I'm not positive if, if it's a manga. I know it is an anime. So there's the Tokyo Ghoul card game. And then I also got... And with Ninja Division in conjunction with Soda Pop Miniatures, I believe it's Soda Pop, I know it's Soda Pop, but I'm pretty sure it's Soda Pop Miniatures. I've got Real Raiders Infinite. And I know one of these titles is coming soon. It's not out yet. So I will have to take a peek. Like I said, this just showed up today. I have not had much time to research any of these except for um, Dance of the Fireflies, which I already knew a little bit about. But I'll take a peek to see which one of these is uh, not out yet, or which is, I think it's on the horizon for February. So I'll make sure that I get, uh, get a nice unboxing out there so we can take a peek, prepare yourself to see uh, if it's something that piques your interest as far as picking it up. Uh, so today I am also 
Gonna move some stuff around here. Gonna do a bit of a how to play Night of Man from Flying Pig Games, designed by my friend Mark H. Walker. And because it is War Game Wednesday, I'm gonna kind of go into some detail about this. I'm not gonna get super, super heavy into the game. I already have a review up over on thegaminggang.com. It's been out for quite a while because this came out in 2016. But I did want to kind of show it off because I really do dig the game. And I know uh, I get questions from folks all the time asking, uh, especially people who enjoy war games, how can they introduce, you know, maybe some of their family members to the hobby, their spouses, significant other friends who maybe aren't really, you know, the whole, you know, let's battle of the bulge. Uh, no, I don't want to play a battle of the bulge game. I don't want to do that. I don't want to play a game about the psalm. Well, you can introduce them eh, with games, other kinds of games that still have some of those mechanics and they're going to scratch that wargamer itch for the grognards out there who are trying to get other folks involved in a little bit of wargaming. I did also mention yesterday that uh, over the weekend, I had a chance to introduce my nephew and his friends to the age-old classic Fletcher Pratt's Naval War Game. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and share some of the things that I I uh, did for it. Last week, I kept saying show off. And I was like, well, no, it's got to be imp- you show off impressive things. It's not overly impressive. But uh, I will talk a little bit about that. And that was pretty cool. Anyway, uh, as far as the news, as I mentioned before, it's kind of quiet news day, but I do have a few items and I am going to lead off with one from Greenbrier Games. And if you're a fan of the Grim Slingers card game, which I am, I thought it was very unique. Enjoyed it quite a bit. It's a cool dueling game and it's uh, a dueling game that's got a story behind it, too. So I dug that quite a bit. So if you're a fan of that, then you should be pretty excited because an expansion is coming on February 7th, and it is Grim Slingers, the Northern Territory. And I've got the dope. Unfortunately, I don't have the images. <laughs> I just have one. Uh, but let me show you, uh, share with you the dope from Greenbrier Games. The Northern Territory contains some of the Forgotten West's strangest and most prolific spectacles, secrets, and adventures. Resist the siren songs of the Red Maidens as you traverse the treacherous paths of the Red River. Brave the unforgiving uh, cavernous interiors of the border wall known as Gates of Hell. Help or hinder newcomers to the Forgotten West in the northern outskirts. Delve into the cryptid, creature-filled depths of the Down Under and uncover ancient secrets in the Great Deep. Explore the Valley of Death anew and more as you set out into the Northern Territory. Grimslingers, the Northern Territory, is an expansion to the Grimslingers core game, which refines and redefines all aspects of the game while adding more of what players love. Better and deeper player versus player gameplay, along with a plethora of new solo slash co-op content for players to delve into for many hours. In February, the Northern Territory will make its way to local game stores. As the reviews come in this spring, hmm, I wonder who might get a chance to review that. Hmm. Me, maybe? Huh? <laughs> Anyway, as the reviews come in this spring, stay tuned for a downloadable bonus campaign that digs even deeper into the mysteries of the Grim Slingers and the Iron Witch. Uh Uh-huh. It is coming out February 7th. I do not happen to have any MSRP information. Sorry to say, I apologize for that. I did not, uh, I did not get any. That was actually some of the info that I was, I was looking to try to get from Julie. But as I mentioned, she's sick, and I would take a guess she's probably got the flu. Now I'm still under the weather. I am hanging in there. So, uh, like I say, knock on wood, it's not the flu. It hasn't completely knocked me for a loop. But um, I'm not feeling too swell. 
Anyway, enough about that. People are like, who cares, Jeff? Whatever. You can be on your deathbed. Just keep the show moving. Uh, Slugfest Games has a new Kickstarter out, and it's for a game that has been around for quite some time, has been pretty popular, and it has gone through various different expansions. Most of the expansions are standalone. And of course, I'm talking about the Red Dragon Inn. And yes, the Red Dragon Inn 7, count them 7, is now on Kickstarter. It just started today, I believe, was the launch, and it is already funded. And this time, the actual <laughs> employees of the Red Dragon Inn are joining in to the festivities. And I have the dope from Slugfest Games. All the heroes have finally turned in for the night. So it's time to kick back with a mug of ale, a fist of dice, and pouches lined with adventurer's gold. The wench joins the party at the Red Dragon Inn, and she's bringing the rest of the tavern crew with her. The Red Dragon Inn 7 is a new 2-4 player standalone expansion to the Red Dragon Inn series of games. In this game, you and up to three of your friends will play as the staff of our beloved tavern, enjoying the night after all the adventuring patrons have passed out in their rooms or stables. Of course, this won't be a quiet night of relaxation. Gamble, brawl, and drink the night away as you prove you have what it takes to keep up with the heroes you handle night after night. The Red Dragon Inn 7 can be combined with all of our previous releases, letting you mix up the characters and the mayhem for games with four or more players. Now, the standalone Red Dragon Inn 7 is for two to four players, plays in about a half hour to an hour. It is for ages 13 and up, and you can score the Kickstarter edition, which is, I believe, going to also be the retail edition, for $40, and there's a special collector's edition for $80. I played Red Dragon in 2 and 3. I have not played it since. And uh, I'm trying to remember if I did the review for it or if Elliot did the review for it. Because we're talking, this is, oh gosh, we're probably talking six, seven years ago over on thegaminggang.com. But uh, it's fun. It's a fun, quick, kind of <laughs> brawling game. It's not just fighting. There's all different things going on, and there are actually, uh, now I, off the top of my head, I don't recall this, but there are, and it's actually going through on uh, one of the, um, the images I'm sharing, there are like these promo drinks, which I think were added later on from the games that I have seen, but uh, yes, be sure to swing on over to Kickstarter, or of course, you can go to slugfestgames.com and learn much, much more about the fully funded in one day Red Dragon in 7. It is Wargame Wednesday, and of course, I like to share some wargaming news. And to do so, I've got actually a project that I was not aware of. Somebody on Twitter had pointed this out to me, and they said, hey, Jeff, you should really check this out because it looks pretty cool. And I have to admit, it does look pretty cool, and it is Normandy, the beginning of the end. And it's a tactical war game, obviously. It's going to simulate D-Day, and it is from Dra Draco Ideas, which is a Spanish company, I want to say. 90% uh, sure that it is a, a company in Spain. And if you do go to their website, you are going to see that it is not in English. But I did want to give you their website. There's a banner right there that you can go to to check out their Kickstarter. As opposed to, because I couldn't fit the Kickstarter <laughs> link <laughs> onto the slides. Anywho, here's the dope from Draco Ideas. Normandy, the beginning of the end, is a tactical war game and the fourth installment of the renowned saga 
War Storm series, WSS, in which players lead their troops through scenarios that take place on the Western Front from the early days of the D-Day landings until August 1944. In this new title, we have overhauled the standard rules manual, now available in both English and Spanish. See, I told you I thought it was a Spanish company. We have reinforced the didactal aspect while maintaining the tactical depth that distinguishes the WSS saga. In addition, we have improved the overall quality of the components. All in all, we have created an excellent product at a very competitive price, and I will agree with that because I will talk about the pricing in just a moment. The scale of the game is at the platoon level. Each unit represents a group of between 30 and 40 infantrymen and three to four crew members for heavy weapons, three to five in the mechanized vehicle units. Each hex on the map depicts an area from about 150 to 200 meters, roughly 165 to 220 yards. The game is divided into turns that represent about 12 to 15 minutes of action. The game uses a system of simultaneous actions we call We Go, a turn-based and real-time hybrid where players will alternate the activation of units. Right now, you can score the base game of Normandy, the beginning of the end, at an early bird price of $39.99. This early bird is over in less than 24 hours, though. It's, pr it's probably at about 19, 20 hours. If you don't get in on the early bird, you can still score the game for $46 once that ends. You can also get the core game plus various expansions. There is a solitaire expansion available for it, as well as I believe there were two others that I saw. You can get that at the early bird special of $79 or once the early bird's over for $85. I will mention that uh, Normandy, the beginning of the end, as opposed to the end of the beginning is fully funded as of right now, so if you'd like to reserve your copy of the game, by all means, swing on over. Uh, like I said, go to their website. It's a little, probably a little easier. Just click on their link or banner, I should say. The banner's in English, so you'll easily figure it out from there. And for too long, our family has been. But I, my goodness, what's going on here? Oh. You know what? For too long, our family has been dis- it. Ah, I had a video for it. And the video is not loading the correct video. Oh, actually, the video is really short. So, <laughs> not, uh, not necessarily missing anything there. I was kind of running around today, getting stuff ready, because uh, I tried to get some uh, of Night of Man set up. So, uh... I was kind of putting together all the uh, slides and frames and things like that sort of last minute. So anyway, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, started playing this video and it's like, whoa, wait a second, that is not the correct video. Uh-huh. Hey, it happens. What can I tell you? Hey, I'm just, you know, I don't have enough subscribers and minutes for anybody, you know, for me to bother trying to put together a quality product here. Anyway, so I was talking about how... Um, over the weekend, I had uh, introduced my nephew and his friends to Fletcher Pratt's Naval War Game. And it is a miniatures game. And it was originally, I want to say, and some folks know of P Fletcher Pratt as, uh, as a writer, as a science fiction author. Uh, and in fact, he, uh, he teamed up quite a bit with um, L. Sprague de Camp. L. Sprague de Camp? I'm sure I'm getting... That name, uh, wrong. Anyway, luckily, Fletcher Pratt's name is fairly easy to pronounce. But uh, basically, it was, it's a miniatures game, and the whole premise is a naval game, is that you are, when you're firing at other ships, you're estimating the range to these ships. And back in the day, uh, I believe he started, started playing it in the 20s, late 1920s. And then by uh, the 30s, especially the late 30s, it was actually pretty popular. In fact, Time Magazine, and I want to say Look Magazine, 
both had articles. Sports Illustrated, I think, might have been in the 50s, had an article about it as well. And they would actually rent out ballrooms. They would have ballrooms, and they may have 50 people on a side all playing this game. And the, the miniatures they would use were all, of course, scratch-built. And they would be about yay big, maybe even bigger. And uh, if you ever look online, you will see there, you know, there's some photos in it. I believe it's from the Life magazine uh, article. And you know, one of the players is like down and he's got, he's got his face against the floor, kind of eyeballing. So as I mentioned that uh, the premise of the game is that, you know, these warships are, are duking it out and you have to estimate the range to hit the ships. And of course, when they're, you know, this big, it'd be fairly easy. But keep in mind that we're talking a ballroom. So you had uh, guns that would fire 350 inches, which that's a long way. Of course, nowadays, it's impossible to do something like that. But I always have had a really, really soft spot for Fletcher Pratt's because I was introduced to it in high school. And of course, my best friend, Elliot Miller, my friend, Scott Weagle, uh, Tim Phelan, all of us, Daryl Melzer, we all played this. And we actually played it uh, both away from school and we were part of a gaming club at Lane Tech High School where I went to high school. And we would actually do it in classrooms. But of course, we used much smaller ships. And of course, you know, we're high school kids. We couldn't afford to go scratch build a bunch of ships. So we used to actually have to trace the ships out of like Jane's fighting ships, Conway's fighting, what is it? Conway's fighting warships. We would go out and we'd get these books. Now, of course, in the 21st century, it's quite a bit easier to track stuff down. You don't have to do any tracing because we would do like an overhead view of the ship because it's important where the shells will drop in. So anyway, so, uh, so I wanted to share some of the stuff that I come up with. Now, one of the things about Fletcher Pratt's is depending on the capabilities of the warship, be it uh, aircraft carrier or battleship or battle cruiser, or heavy cruiser, light cruiser, you know, destroyer, whatever, will determine the point value that that ship has. And it's uh, kind of a step reduction system that Fletcher Pratt uses. So, of course, if a shell hits and it penetrates the armor, it does so much damage, depending on the size of the gun that was fired. So there's a few calculations, and usually it's the referee who has to handle, which, of course, I was refereeing for my nephew and his... My nephew Cameron, his friend Cameron, his friend Alex, and also their friend Kyle. So I thought, okay, so I came up with... Oddly enough, I'll actually share some of this. So I was working on uh, ship sheets because you have to kind of go through and you have to create all this stuff. Now, back in the day when I was in high school, give me a sec to grab a sip here. Back when I was in high school, we had to type all this stuff out on a typewriter. We obviously didn't have the, the overviews that we could utilize and things like that. And, uh, huh, wait a second here. Let's see something. I've got more images than this. What is going on? Give me one second here. I'm going to fix this. All right, let's see. Now it should. Should share. What's going on? Come on. There we go. <laughs> Told you I was running around trying to make sure I got Night of Man set up, sort of. Anyway, so uh, so back in the day, you had to sit there with a calculator. Now, now keep in mind, when this game originally was created, because there's a fairly complex formula to come up with these ship points. They didn't have handheld calculators back in the 20s and 30s. 
So just imagine how much work had to go into not only, you know, computing the total damage value of these ships, but also going through because you'll, you have to put down like every step. So anyway, so, uh, so I went through and I, I Photoshopped some stuff. So I, I of course created these ship sheets, which you're seeing, uh, the Queen Elizabeth class battleship, uh, the Maryland class battleships and the California class battleships. And so I went ahead and was able to track down some overhead shots, some overhead line drawings, and then did a little Photoshop stuff so that there's, you know, ocean waves and a wake and the bows are breaking through the waves and, and things like that. So uh, kind of a lot of work. So anyway, so I put all this stuff together and then eh, we don't have to keep staring at that. So, uh, so then I just went and I printed off the ships and then I went and got some dollar store kind of like styrofoam hobby boards and then glued them on. So that is the ship just to kind of give you an example of the scale. There's my hand, right? So I went, uh, and made these. <laughs> And of course, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, oh, it's upside down, Jeff. Duh. So anyway, so uh, so I was making these and I thought, well, uh, this styrofoam stuff was pretty crummy. Trying to cut it with a hobby knife, it was just kind of disastrous. But I was also like, you know what? I'm not going to invest a ton of time into this because what if these guys don't like it? Because uh, my... My nephew Cameron, I, I like to tell him stories about when I was younger, when I was his age and the kind of games that we would play. Because he's really mainly a video gamer, but being introduced to all these different board games, he's really become a big tabletop gamer. He really, I, I find him spending less and less time playing video games, which I, no knock against video games, but you know, tabletop games, you know, a little more a little more thinking, a little more uh, mental heavy lifting involved sometimes than, than some of the video games, especially some of the stuff that Cam plays. So anyway, so I thought to myself, uh, all right, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, well, not time, because, yeah, there was time involved. I wasn't going to spend a lot of money or a lot of time creating these ship models, only to find out that, you know, they hated it because... Fletcher Pratt is kind of a an acquired taste, I guess we would say. Although, interestingly enough, even though it, it is a war game, it's simulating naval battles and everything, uh, a lot of women played Fletcher Pratt's. And it was it was so popular that actual actually the the naval college and naval planners played it a bunch, uh, especially in the 30s. And because it does, it simulates pretty well what would happen in a you know, naval battle. Now, what it does not do a very good job of is modeling aircraft and air attacks and things like that. Because when the rules were originally produced, you really didn't, you know, naval planners didn't think the airplane was that big a deal. You know, granted, there were a few... Uh, military advisors who are like, no, this is the, the day of the battleship is over. It's the aircraft carrier. But for the most part, no, it was still big gun navies. So anyway, so I, so we're playing and uh, I started off by kind of explaining some, some basics to Cameron and his friends about you know, just naval tactics. You know, don't, uh, don't sit there and don't allow someone to cross your T like so. Of course, they would be much further away, but because, of course, the one ship is going to be able to bring the entire broadside to bear all the way down the length of this. And because there is range estimation, you're writing down how far away you think that ship is. That just, that's giving you a way bigger target. So I actually ran the game as it was originally 
laid out in the first set of the Fletcher Pratt rules because they have been updated and edited and revised over the years. There's a, there's a release from Wargame, wargaming.co that I reviewed their physical book that was through Lulu. It was horrible. I savaged it because it wasn't formatted properly and you really couldn't, couldn't make out. There was just tons and tons of just graphical errors in it and there were so many it just was just a real hassle and real struggle to read through and then the charts were all uh out of focus they were all kind of faded and blurry so you know there's armor penetration in that so i really ripped into the book and the uh the author alongside fletcher pratt john curry i believe is his name had said, oh no, you must have gotten a preview book and we'll get you a new copy out. Never got it. So gave him the opportunity. He said, hey, you know, I'll revise his review if you send me a, a copy that's actually legible that, you know, you can use. So uh, I wanted to get the kids at least, and Elliot Miller is like, yeah, dude, I'm in. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Fletcher's, yeah, we're playing Fletcher's. Although he couldn't make it this weekend to play. So anyway, so I bit the bullet and I saw that there was a Kindle edition on Amazon. And I thought, okay, I, I'll, I'll pay for another copy of these rules. And they better not be the same mess they were <laughs> that physical book. Because I even had somebody comment on the review. And this was, I don't know, a year ago. So, of course, this, this review now is about uh, five, six years old that I did about this printed edition. And he said, oh, I think, I think you're being really harsh and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I got the, I got the ebook and the ebook was fine. I was like, dude, I understand your comment, but I'm talking about, I'm reviewing the physical book I got. It's great. Four years later, you got, you got an ebook that's fine. I got to stand by what I had, had written, you know. So I will say, thankfully, that the Kindle edition uh, cleans up a lot of it. Uh, there are still typos and things like that. And you can tell that the ebook wasn't really formatted correctly for Kindles because it's only available for, uh, from Amazon for Kindle in the, what is it? Uh, AZ something format. It's not Moby, it's AZ something. So anyway, so, uh, so thankfully you can go to amazon.com and it's 10 bucks. You can get the rules for 10 bucks. And yes, it is now worth a purchase. I am not going to rewrite a review I did uh, five, six years ago for a physical book because I have no proof that that physical book <laughs> is any different than it was. So anyway, so I introduced the, the guys to playing it. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I'm like, okay, I hope these guys at least sort of, you know, at least kind of dig it, right? So all I did is I just, uh, it was just battleships because what I'm looking to do is uh, kind of a hypothetical World War uh, 1930-ish because I don't want to, I don't want to get into the whole, I don't want to force players to play the Nazis, the fascists, the Axis. I don't want to force anybody to have to do that. So around 1930, there are still, especially Japan, Japan uh, and their invasion of China rattled a lot of people and there were possibilities that uh, hostilities could have broken out between Japan and Russia and that could have spilled over. So that's kind of what I'm doing. So anyway, so, uh, so I played it. I, I should say I refereed it and these guys loved it. <laughs> they just, well, one of Cameron's friends who's, he plays some games with us, but he's not, he's a good kid. Don't get me wrong, but he just, things don't click with him well. Uh, I guess he sort of, you know, thought it was okay. But Cameron and his two other friends were like, oh man, this is awesome. One of his, one of his friends, his other friend Cameron's talking about, oh man, this would be great if we could do like, uh, you know, people have their navies and, you know, we got the, you know, uh, map and stuff. And I'm like, that's what I'm looking to do here kind of make a strategic thing because we did that kind of stuff back in high school and that when we played Fletcher's so it was it wouldn't always be oh it's just battleships banging away so getting some destroyers and cruisers and things like that in and open up a whole lot of other 
tactical options. So anyway, I was super, super pleased to see that uh, the kids dug it. They dug Fletcher Pratt's. In fact, uh, my brother was out of town. He was, uh, my brother works for Southwest Airlines. And uh, he came back and I talked to him uh, Monday. And he's like, oh, for crying out loud, man, all I keep hearing from Cameron is just about that game you guys played, which my brother had played Fletcher Pratt's back in the day, but we were actually playing with really small. But it was funny because I actually did the, uh, you're supposed to have, not only do you have to estimate the range between the ships, you have to, have, you have a firing arrow that you have to lay down so that you are actually aiming <laughs> at the other ships, which can be pretty interesting. Because there were a couple of times that uh, one of the players were pretty spot on with their range, but their arrows were off. So, had a lot of fun. Uh, I will. I did not get any photos of us playing, and uh, I'm not okay. Golden Rule says I'm not sure what you're talking about, but it sounds cool. Oh, I am talking about. I was introducing my nephew and his friends to a game called Fletcher Pratt's Naval War Game. And uh, this uh, will be up later on, the full video. You can kind of catch it. And uh, yeah, they had a blast. It's an old game from like the 1920s and 30s that I was introduced to in high school from some friends in high school that we had a club. So anyway, so yes, I was very, very pleased to see that uh, the kids liked it. They liked it a lot. So they're already talking about, oh, hey, when are we going to play again? And, you know, I want this Navy and I want that Navy. And I was like, okay, well, you know, we still have to play other games too <laughs> because I got to get reviews out there. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I rambled on about Fletcher Pratt. And I, as the Golden Rule <laughs> pointed out in chat, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds pretty cool. I'll look it up. Fletcher Pratt's Naval War Game. And War Game is two words in that title, which is, of course, not proper English, but, well, I don't know. Most people just, I just have War Game as one word. So anyway, so I had mentioned I'm going to take a peek at Night of Man from Flying Pig Games. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to switch over to the other camera here. Let's make sure that... Uh, Yep, there we go. All right, grab me a sip. Hey, hopefully the audio is in sync. Because for some strange reason, I don't know what's been going on with YouTube. Besides them thinking, hey, you suck, so we're not going to allow you to uh, monetize your videos after February 20th. But um, things, the stream seems to be okay. And uh, hey, Harry Ryan... Thanks for tea. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome, Harry. Uh, I was going to say, um, the stream audio has been fine during the stream as far as I can tell. Maybe a little bit off. And then when YouTube renders the video and saves it, it's been, I've had to go and I've actually had to delete the stream. I've had to download it, get it. Oh, hey, uh, Kickstarter Normandy game. Hey, no problem. It looks pretty cool. Uh, somebody had pointed that out to me on uh, Twitter. I didn't know anything about it. But it does look pretty cool. And uh, an early bird price of $40 for a war game? That's pretty sweet. That's a pretty sweet deal. Anyway, okay. So, moving right along. Oh, um, yeah. So, anyway, the, the sound's been out of sync. I've had to actually download the video. I've had to wait for it to process on YouTube, then download it separate the audio out, sync it back up, re-upload it. It's been a real pain because that's a bunch of time that I could be working on something else that I got to devote to that. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that that is not going to be a problem today because I think I might have nipped it in the butt. All right, so anyway, so we're, gonna, we're looking at Night of Man from Flying Pig Games. And I do apologize uh, for those of you floating around in chat. I probably won't be able to jump in a lot uh, as I'm kind of showing this off a little bit. Uh, I will peek over every once in a while to see if somebody's got a question or something like that. So anyway, so the premise here 
there's there's a few reasons why I want to show this off, and I, I'm going to mention that I am not going to go into every tiny detail about this game, because I am sure that there are, by now, there are plenty of videos out there that are going to get into the nitty-gritty of Night of Man, because it's been out since 2016. But one of the reasons why I wanted to share this is because number one, it's a good game. It's a really good game. I enjoy it. And it's a nice way to try to introduce non-war gamers to wargaming concepts that might help influence them <laughs> into playing other war games with you, as opposed to busting out something saying, uh, hey, uh, well, for an example, Normandy, the beginning of the end looks really cool. Probably not a game that you would want to break out with someone who's not a war gamer. But this has a lot of really cool little wrinkles to it. I do like the card driven aspect of the game as well. So we're going to take a peek. So first off, the premise of the game is it's the future, not too far off in the future. And aliens have invaded Earth and they won. They won. Humanity lost. And humans are pretty much subju been subjugated by these aliens. And Night of Man basically means that it is the Night of Man. Things are really, really dark uh, for the human race. So what Night of Man is, is that uh, the humans have pretty much gathered their, their last bastions of resistance. And it's going to be their last stand. And there are eight scenarios for you to play in the game that do follow the story. Now, I've just thrown some counters out here, got some stuff. First thing, uh, I don't have anything set up for a scenario. I'm just going to kind of show you how the game plays, talk about some aspects of it that I really think are cool. And as I mentioned previously, I have a review of this at thegaminggang.com that you can read. So by all means, check it out. Other reason why I want to share it is uh, I'll, I'll have to double check it. I may actually go online as I'm streaming when I finish up the show. Double check to make sure that this is still on sale from Flying Pig Games because last week it was on sale for $56, which in my opinion is a really, really great deal to pick up Night of Man. So first thing we're going to do here, and I hate to say it, but I'm going to have to bust out Ye old reading specs. Oh, yeah. First thing you'll notice, if you are a, a war gamer, these are really nice, big, chunky counters. And that is something that I have noticed the uh, Flying Pig is really big on, is with their, with their games, they've got these big, big, chunky counters. Now, I'm going to give you kind of an example comparison in size now this is this is actually a much smaller counter than you no nah, i shouldn't say much smaller this is a bit smaller than what you'd normally see in a war game but not by a ton and then just kind of compare it so this is a vehicle counter now there are these big walkers that the aliens have too that are just a little bit bigger but the vehicles and infantry and the characters i mean that that's a good size counter. This isn't one of those games where you guys. I mean, I don't have huge hands. Okay, so I'm just pointing out I do not have monster size hands, but that gives you a really good idea of the size of these counters. So, taking a look at the count uh, at the units, some of the units that are in the game. So the humans. This is just kind of a. a standard infantry-ish uh, unit. And you'll have various different icons as well as numbers around the counter. So the first thing you're going to look at is, well, I shouldn't say first thing. One of the things you're going to look at is, you see the minus one red? So that is when they're attacking an armored unit. So they don't have really great armor penetration 
abilities because they're just a, an infantry unit. And as you can see, and I, I gotta say, I dig the top-down view. And now I'm gonna go old school on it because it, it reminds me so much of all the stuff that Steve Jackson Games used to do, like with Car Wars and that. And they would have uh, the various different top-down views of the drivers like running and, you know, pedestrians with guns and stuff. So it's like XCOM the board game? No. No, not... Well, okay, I take that back. I've only seen XCOM the board game in action. But as far as I could tell, no, it's not. It is uh, not like XCOM the board game, especially as far as how it'll play. Okay, so anyway, so we've got... Uh, so there we have... We've got the minus one as far as their armor penetration when they're attacking armored units. Then we've got here a one... That's pretty much their high explosives. So that's when they're attacking what would be considered soft targets, other infantry units, uh, the some of the alien units. This three and an L, the three and the L means that it's got a movement allowance of three, and the L means uh, legs, because they're legging it out. Then you're gonna see down here, they've got a power. Now there's a difference between powers and abilities. Powers can only be activated by the play of a card. Abilities can be used at any time. Then we've got this little asterisk here. That's basically their armor, which pretty much means they don't have any armor. And then we see there's this little icon here. That little icon there is indicating that they can advance into assault combat. So that's close quarters combat. And uh, there's a plus, so they'll get a plus one. And then up here, that is a range modifier. So some, some units are, are good at firing at various ranges. Infantry, not so much, because they're, you know, more small arms. So if you've got that, kind of give you an idea with the, the mecha here, which the aliens kind of, uh, they kind of wear like these exoskeletons is one way to kind of look at it. So you see here, they've got a zero for their AP. They've got a two for their uh, attacking soft targets, high explosive. They got a movement of four. They're not really considered armored, but they also have these special ability icons. And all of this stuff is going to be found on your handy dandy reference sheets ah, where did it go All right. so each player is going to have one of these reference sheets it's going to show AP range modifiers so that's really when you're firing at armored units vehicles really and high explosive range modifiers then it's going to talk about here as far as the terrain what the terrain will do costs more to move through different terrain. Game also includes a sequence of play. And you know what? I had thought there was a handout for the special one. Special abilities. Let me go. Here we go. So you're going to see there's the abilities. Oh, I know why I thought there was a handout. We had made a photocopy. <laughs> we had scanned the pages so we both had them handy, but I don't have them in the box. It's weird. Then there's powers. Okay, so as I said, I'm not going to go into, you know, every smallest detail about this game. But uh, just kind of give you an idea of... Well, let's look at an Abrams tank. Show you how these are a little bit different. So now you're seeing armor piercing is 4. High explosive 2. Movement 8. And that is a tracked vehicle, which uh, wheeled vehicles, tracked vehicles, things like that. They don't, you got eight movement factors. That doesn't necessarily mean you're just going to get to move eight squares. Then it shows the power, armor, range modifier. So you see here, they've got a, they've got a bonus range modifier. And makes that show you a hover car. It's like the hover car. Now, one thing I thought was really cool in Night of Man is the aliens get these walker units 
which I showed you the size of those, which you actually, the alien player will build. Um, oh, uh, like XCOM in a board game version. Yeah, a little bit. I, you know, I, I guess um, if you if you lost XCOM, yeah, then I guess the aliens would take over. But the cool thing with this is you'll have so many um, build points and you're able to, that's these tokens I was showing you, these counters. You can buy like these enhancements to these, these walkers because they're supposed to be these big walkers. So you got You get to customize them, and uh, it's it's really neat. And of course, you know they can take a lot of damage. All right, so everything in Night of Man is card driven, and you'll have various different scenarios in the book. And it's going to talk about so punching through. It's going to show you get to see these how the uh, board, the maps are set up. There's even some rules about creating your own scenarios in the game. So I just got a couple of the maps laid out here so we could kind of keep uh, everything sort of in focus. So the game is card driven. And you're going to see with the different cards, there's different areas of the card that you're going to look at. So each player is going to start off, they're going to receive a hand of four cards. And during each turn, you're going to be drawing cards so that you have four cards in your hand when it's your, let's say, your impulse in the turn. So you're going to have actions. So these are the actions up here. Oh, I see uh, Smokey has decided to come visit down here. Please don't go jumping around on stuff, Smokes. So you got actions are green. The end turn, because there is a variable end turn. So it's not uh, you get to do a certain number of things and then the turn ends. You're actually going to draw end turn cards. So you've got support cards. So you got support, which is yellow, which can be played to modify an action. Then you got red up here which are reaction cards. You can play these as a reaction to something that the other player has done. So you start off, uh, let's just uh, let's grab some cards here real quick. And there's some other aspects to the cards too I'll show you in just a sec. So let's say this is the aliens. Yes, I know that's not how you're supposed to deal cards, but I gotta go back and forth. All right, so this is where we would have, let's say these are the humans, right? So to begin the turn, you're going to bid. Oh, hey, thanks for uh, planning on subscribing, Golden Rule. I appreciate that. Thank you. Go get your kids from school. <laughs> this is, they say, I gotta go get my kids from school, but I'm definitely subscribing to your channel. It's pretty interesting. Well, thanks. Okay, so anyway, so you're going to see that some of the cards have numbers. And to begin, you're going to actually see now these cards, it's a zero and a miss. So you wouldn't be able to use these cards to bid for initiative. So if the human player really wanted to make sure that they got a, an opportunity to go first, they would bid the higher number. And the thing is, if you win the bid for initiative, you'll lose that card. You won't have that card. So let's say as an example, the human player says, yes, I will actually run the possibility of not having this bullet storm slash ambush card to see if I can get the initiative. And then the alien player is sitting there and they're like, well, okay. Of course, you don't, you would have these both face down. You're not going to share it with the other player. You're going to pick the card you're going to use and you're going to put it face down. You re reveal it at the same time. So as far as the alien player, they might say, okay, well, I want to make sure I go first. I'm playing this nine. Then you would reveal it. 
So you'd see, okay, nine versus five. Of course, obviously nine's higher. The human player would get to take their card back. The losing player, the winning player will have to discard their card and the losing player will get that card back into their hand. So everything's done. Eh, let's just scatter these troops around here a little bit. I'll put some armored units back here. This isn't a fair fight by any stretch, but uh, this there are like special characters. So the humans get more special characters, heroes, than uh, the aliens do. The hover car. Mecha. Okay. Oh, there's another mecha. Okay. So the first thing you'll do is you'll look at your cards. What can you do? Okay, so I've got a fire card. I've got a move card. And when you take a look, it says, play this card to fire with an eligible unit or group of units. Then you've got move. Play this card to move one unit. Then we got first fire. That's a reaction. And then there's bloodlust, which don't really have to worry about at the moment here. Critical hit, first fire. Bullet Storm Ambush. Well, these are support cards. So really, the only thing the human player could do in this turn is they're going to play either to fire or to move. Line of Sight does work in the game here. There's various different terrain. These are like hills, so they block terrain. Let's lift that up a little bit for you. Just uh, to give you a a better view because the red outline on terrain that blocks line of sight and I can I understand why Flying Pig Games did this because they don't want a big red you know big red areas kind of taking away from the look of the terrain laid out on the map but it, it can be a little tough to see so that blocks terrain then you've got different terrain types that can provide cover as well. And of course, once again, it's all right there in your handy dandy sheet. So, oh, just as an example, let's just say, eh, let's switch these guys up. We'll say, okay, human player is going to play fire. Now, any unit that would be in line of sight could team up and fire on a single target. And line of sight just basically draw a line from center to center. If something's blocking it, then it blocks it. You can't shoot. So we'll say the M60 here, M60 team, decides they're going to open up on this mecha unit here. And they're not in any concealment. They're not in cover or anything like that. So, and they're pretty close up. And what you could do, it's in line of sight. Nothing's blocking their view. You could decide that you wanted to utilize this dragon anti-tank unit as well. Which I would maybe probably not do. To be very honest, I probably wouldn't do something like that because... The human players don't have a lot of anti-tank capabilities outside of some of their vehicles and the dragon anti-tank. Uh, they carry like laws, stuff like that. Uh, I would probably hang on to them and hope to get a, an opportunity to use them against an armored target later. So what you would do is you would basically take a look and you're going to see that, okay, so it's got a three high explosive it's a range of twos. You just count the squares. You're going to take a look and you're going to see high explosive. And you'll see that there's an asterisk here as far as a firing modifier. Because it's going to tell you, oh, is there a bonus that the vehicles or the 50 cal or the dragon team get for a certain range? And it shows here one to two. Well, it's two squares away. It's going to get a plus one. 
there's nothing that's going to modify that because they're not in cover. So what you'll do is that means that with three, you're going to play that fire card and then you're going to draw three cards and you're looking here for hits in this box here. That's what this box represents. You've got results down here, but really all you're looking at here is hits. So that would be one hit. There's no hit indicator there, so that's nothing. And a hit. So that would be two hits. So the first hit on any unit is going to shake it. Oh, they were firing there. So they would become a shaken unit, and then it's going to tell you that a shaken unit, their movement is halved. It's also indicating here that they've lost that ability. Let's put that on there. Now it took two hits, right? So you're actually gonna flip it to its reduced strength, its reduced side. So its capabilities are lost. Well, not lost, but I the capabilities have been lowered because it's taking damage. Uh, shaking counters cannot be re removed unless you're able to uh, play a rally card. So they would be shaken. They would also have taken damage from the M60 machine gun team. And you would mark them as fired. So they have fired. They've in, in your in a turn, your units can fire or move. There are cards that will allow you to move and fire, but for the most part, they will fire and move one or the other. You also have an ops complete. So there are certain uh, situations where you, you'll drop the ops complete. So if you had played a card that allowed a fired unit to fire again, or a unit that moved, and then you played a card that allowed it to fire later, you're gonna mark it ops complete, meaning it can't do anything else. So, human player would have played their fire card, and then it would move on to the, yeah, what was this? Was this the alien's hand? No. This was the alien's hand. Now you get an end turn card. So depending on the scenario, when you get an end turn, when you draw an end turn, you're to count that towards an end of a turn. Sometimes it'll say, you know, once you draw three or no, I think it's a little higher than that. Uh, yeah, maybe it was three. Once you draw so many end turns, then the turn will end because you're going to end up shuffling this deck a lot. Now, I had these cards in sleeves, but I had noticed earlier when I was kind of taking a peek, the sleeves were giving off way too much glare, so you couldn't really read any of these cards. So, I was, uh, it would be the alien player's turn. Now, the alien player gets to draw up to four cards. So, they're going to get another card to replace the one that they had lost when they won the initiative. Now, they might sit there and say, okay, well, let's see. I can fire or move. Drop that out. Fast move. So they can move a unit, an extra two movement. Then there's reload and fire. And light wounds. So really, they're looking at, okay, well, I've got... Probably they're going to play with the fire and move or I'm sorry, the fire or move. Now they might be sitting there saying, hey, you know what? I really, because I've got that, uh, eh, no, they don't have, I thought uh, for a second, I thought they had a uh, move and fire. All right, so they may decide, hey, you know what? I really want to get this shredder up here. So it's got a movement of six, and then you're going to take a look because that says it's a tracked vehicle. Okay, well, this is all clear, but... You're still always going to just quickly take a peek to make sure, because wheeled vehicles are actually going to use up more movement going through various different terrain. So the tracked is only one. 
So they could move one, two, three. Mm. Yeah, uh, actually, I shouldn't move it like that. I should put it upside down because with vehicles, you can only actually move into the three squares that are in front. So the way I was showing it, uh, it was actually moving backwards, but I have it upside down so you can get a better better idea of seeing the counters when you're going full screen. So they may decide, well, I wanted to move them. So you're just going to keep going back and forth playing the different cards. And there's a lot of cool stuff on the cards. There's artillery strikes. You're going to look... Uh, now, one thing that some people may not like about the game, which I don't have any issue whatsoever, is all the hits and everything come from the deck of cards. There are no dice. Everything's in the cards. So when you're firing, uh, like, say, kind of armored vehicle on armored vehicle, then you use the AP, not the HE. Use the AP. You do the range. So you also, you know, go pull out your handy dandy AP range. And one of the cool things too is uh, that um, there's some good range distances in this game too. So it's not like you got to spend a whole lot of time moving your troops all over the place before you can start, you know, throwing lead, <laughs> things like that. So what you basically do is you're going to just do your modifiers like you kind of did for the... Uh, combat and then what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with a number that you need to flip a card and this time rather than this side you're looking at this side and you're looking for a number now this says miss so that just means right away that attack missed uh, give you kind of an idea here there we go we'd have a three so let's say for an example, uh, the Shredder. No, that actually isn't a very good example. Now eh, let's see. Let's say the Hover Car. Let's switch it out. Let's go Hover Car. And we'll put a uh, Bradley Fighting Vehicle over here. So let's say the Hover Car would have been shooting at the Bradley. So we see that it's, it's going to get zero modification. It does have the AP value of one. So it gets nothing to its targeting. This is in the in, in the wide open, so it's not gonna do anything. So you're gonna look at the range for the AP modifiers, and it just says add to AP. Well, you would get plus one. So the AP for this for this attack would be two. So you would be looking at you're just flipping, you're not going to flip a bunch of cards. You're going to just be flipping over one card, looking at the number here, and you have to get that number or higher to score the hit. And you, uh, armored units, they don't have a reduced step. They just become wrecks. So unlike the infantry, when because these are considered to be single units, and these infantry units, these soft targets, tend to represent a group. <coughs> now, of course, vehicles can be shaken, too. So first hit is always going to shake it. Second hit is going to destroy it. So anyway, so you've got all these different cards, all these different kind of counteractions you can make. And that was, that's the one of the big things I really dig about this game is that... Yeah, you know, once you settle into how um, how the hits are done. I mean, there's like artillery. Artillery doesn't come into play a whole lot, but you can get an artillery card or you can drop down an artillery barrage. And the characters, they've got all these different abilities. Like uh, one of the characters, Doc, because it's supposed to be some of the, some of the humans have mutated. So some of them have these psychic abilities. So Doc has like this telekinetic blast he can use. Uh, the humans have this sniper, which is really cool. So I like 
the aspect of how there's all these different little little wrinkles for the different units. It doesn't constantly play the same way. So for an example, like if you were using dice, you would say, okay, well, it's always the same kind of thing. I, I'm rolling these dice to get whatever. Whereas, and you'll see this, uh, GMT's Combat Commander has the same kind of thing. It's you're, you're actually getting your hit results and everything from cards. There's just something sort of like, okay, well, yeah, you know, in a regular, regular war game with combat result tables and stuff, all I need to do is roll a two <laughs> on, you know, two six-sided dice, and I'm going to hit this guy and wipe out their tank. Well, with the cards, it's like, nah, <laughs> that ain't happening. Sorry. Uh, but like here you'll see there's an indication power. As I mentioned before, some of the units have abilities, like this command unit has the two abilities, but it doesn't have a power. So the abilities can be used. They're kind of, um, well, I guess I would say um, not necessarily active. Uh, you don't have to activate them is what I guess I would say. You don't have to activate the power or their, their ability because it's always there. Whereas the power, you have to have a card that will allow you to utilize that power. So, uh, oh, as I noticed, I dropped uh, one of the counters down on the floor. So, anyway, that's kind of uh, kind of how Night of Man will play. And the the action's pretty fast. Oh, uh, well, other thing I should point out: one of the phases when the turn you're you're basically playing the cards back and forth, and the turn ends, you get excuse me a reserve phase where you get to move units that are not close to the action up, which I actually liked quite a bit because it keeps everything moving quick. So rather than sitting there and using using your cards to have to move units that are way back at the, at the back of the, you know, the map, that reserve phase allows you to start moving these guys up. Uh, but you can only move within, uh, you can't move closer than three squares to the enemy. Uh, and in reserve movement, you can actually pull units back too. So uh, that I thought was kind of cool too, because then you're not sitting there, you know, you're not going to go through tons and tons of cards for a turn, just playing card, hoping, you know, drawing cards and getting cards so you can move your units that are far back out of the action into the action. So that keeps the game moving along really, really nicely. The other thing I dig about the, the card play and uh, you're alternating your turns back and forth is that uh, sometimes, you know, you're kind of stuck. <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't have any cards that really do anything great. Uh, but you got to kind of do, you kind of got to work with what you've got. And then uh, at the end of your turn, you can discard down to one card. So at the beginning of the next turn, you can draw more cards. So if you're if you're kind of stuck there with kind of a stinker hand, uh, then at the end of the turn, you can end up uh, at the beginning of the new turn, draw new cards. Turn can also end if each player passes on their turn. So if you've got nothing you can do with your hand, you can pass. And if your opponent says, yeah, okay, that's fine. I pass two, then that turn ends. The game does not last super long that was another thing that i really dug about this and i thought this is a great way to introduce people who are not into war games kind of into some of the concepts used in war games is because you're not going to sit down and play a scenario of night of man for three four hours it's just not going to happen now that doesn't mean that you don't play a scenario for an hour and then everybody's like you know both of you are like oh yeah yeah, let's, hey, what's the next scenario? Let's play the next scenario. Other thing that's very cool about the game, too, is the scenarios are, they've got uh, some cool stuff going on. There's, uh, like, the first scenario where the, the humans are basically uh, making their last-ditch effort. It actually, the scenario opens up that a bunch of armored units have gotten wiped out by the aliens, and you've got all these wrecks across the board. And it's kind of cool because one of those wrecks is actually an operational <laughs> vehicle that can be revealed later on. It's so, like there's a, a dragon anti-tank team that can be popped up on one of the cover 
uh, one of the uh, various different uh, terrain squares that uh, provide a cover of two. They've been hiding there. They've been hunkered down. Very, very neat. Uh, very, very cool scenario design. Anyways, uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of turning this into a, a review, which I didn't mean to make it into a review. Just wanted to kind of show off a little bit about Night of Man. Now, like I said, there's there's a bunch of other stuff going on in Night of Man that, you know, I'm not going to go dive way deep into. Uh, Got to be honest, it's been a few months since I played. So, and I uh, hadn't really had time to just read through <laughs> the entire rule book again. <laughs> so, I know I'm glossing over some stuff. Anyway, so that is Night of Man. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a peek right now. I apologize for sitting here making folks. Uh, here we go. Night of Man. What we got? Are we still on sale? No. Ah, Mark, come on, dude. <laughs> Rats. Okay, so it was on sale for $56. Not a man is back up to 80 bucks. That's why it was such a really, really good deal. Okay, so uh, we're just going to have to say, hey, Mark, come on, buddy. Put it on sale for a couple of days, special 48-hour deal. Come on, man. And once they sold out possible they sold out <laughs> anyway well uh pretty jam-packed show did a lot of rambling on a lot of talking anyway when you are not watching the daily dope be sure to go visit the gaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news reviews comics movies tv come on you know the drill get your geek on at the gaminggang.com also if you have watched the whole video or you're at the end do me a huge favor, please subscribe to the channel. If you want, you know, give a little thumbs up. Uh, as I started off the show, this whole YouTube thing where they're just going to, you know, take a few few bucks every month out of the smaller streamers and content creators' pockets just isn't cool. So, you know, I'm trying to, you know, trying to do what I can to, because I'm just like, just so short on just a few different things. So anyway, uh, on subscribers and, and watch time. But that is the show for today. I am Jeff McAleer. I will be back tomorrow. Uh, still up in the air on what I'm going to do as far as uh, an RPG I might take a look at. Then again, I might take a look at one of these Ninja Division games too. But uh, I will be back tomorrow. And until then, enjoy your hump day.